You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation, old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to VanuPodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. Welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm your host, Shane. I come to you today with a brief introduction, uh, some announcements, and then the audio version of my originally, I guess, non-verbal interview with Jim Stum, the man who met Rayo. Of course, we are in the midst of our series on Timber Autonomous Zones, and next week, we will get back to that. I've got a bit more development to do on the next episode, and I also have to catch up on a show or two of Smuggler and Frank Braun's Cypherpunk Bitstream Podcast. Uh, definitely check that out. Uh, I know it's on Spotify, and uh, Smuggler and Frank have both shared it on uh, Twitter. Uh, they've been uh, talking a lot about Tazis, and uh, they certainly have a lot of knowledge to share on the topic. But yeah, we've been uh, busy over at Liberty Under Attack Publications. Uh, we released a new book by Kyle Reardon titled An Elusive Phantom of Hope, A Critique of Reformism. Uh, so yeah, within the realm of the servile society, politics is often touted as the primary way to implement societal change. Everyone has heard the infamous saying, if you don't like the law, work to change it. In an elusive phantom of hope, author Kyle Reardon examines each of the various political strategies, uh, voting, running for political office, uh, petitioning your representatives, grassroots lobbying, etc., and attempts to either confirm or debunk political crusading, mostly from utilitarian grounds. Reardon also takes a look at a couple of strategies uh, commonly pursued in the alternative media, uh, filming government agents and suing the government in an effort to judge their efficacy. Uh, he doesn't mince his words either. Anyone who reads this book will know once and for all, uh, if you don't already, uh, that working inside the system is no way out and is only giving legitimacy to the most dangerous superstition. Uh, for those who truly care about the future prospects of freedom, it's time to seek another way off the plantation. You can seek a copy by uh, by visiting libertyunderattack.com uh, forward slash IPOH. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash IPOH. I'll definitely put a link to that uh, in the show notes. Uh, you can also find the book uh, on Amazon via that uh, same link, uh, libertyunderattack.com slash IPOH. Uh, I also uploaded two audiobooks uh, to Amazon's Audiobook Exchange, uh, Vanu Book 2, Letters from Rayo, and Matthew Watecki's Brushfire. Uh, you can listen to Vanu Book 2, as well as going mobile for free on the Liberty Under Attack YouTube channel. Uh, if you want a short teaser of Brushfire, narrated by Silas Soul and Miriam Zachariah, please check out our fascist book or Instagram pages. I think it's also on the YouTube channel uh, as well. Uh, now, I was hoping to have links to purchase Vani Book 2 and Brushfire. Uh, it's the main reason I delayed on recording this podcast, honestly. Uh, but unfortunately, Amazon is just slow as fuck in general now, I guess. Um, that's just how it is. I'm, I'm not, not really sure what's going on, but uh, that's uh, kind of the trend. But uh, yeah, I'll let you know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, one more announcement in regards to LUA Publications. Uh, so we're looking for someone reliable uh, that will be at each of the following Freedom Festival's uh, conferences. Uh, number one, MidFest in Oklahoma. Uh, I might have this one covered, uh, but I'm not 100% uh, sure. If you're going, I'd certainly be interested in chatting. Uh, and I guess just as a little... I, I don't know. Like I, I really don't know if this is going to happen. Um, I mean, this was... Uh, Jason Paradise and I kind of just exchanged a couple comments um, we've been to a lot of freedom festivals together. We go riding down here, uh, um, here at the homestead. He's, yeah, he's, he's, he's come to, he's come over here quite a few times. Um, so yeah, we've uh, gone to quite a few of these festivals and we exchange a few comments. Like, I guess it's not impossible to, to go to Midfest cause it's, uh, it's in Oklahoma. It's like seven hours, uh, Southwest, uh, of where I am. And that's about the same distance as the uh, as what the MPL Fest is this year. So um, the distance is no excuse not to go. Um, so I guess what I, I guess I should probably reach out to him and talk uh, and, and talk to him because I might just have that one covered. I don't know. Um, we'll see. But uh, yeah. Anyway, if, uh, if if you're going, I'd, I'd certainly be interested in chatting. Uh, number two, Anarch Arizona and Arizona. Um, it's in March some sometime uh, I think. And uh, lastly, uh, Libre Planet, uh, the Free Software Foundation's event uh, in Cambridge, Cambridge uh, Massachusetts. Uh, and that's March 14th to 15th. So if you're going to any of these uh, events and want to help us out, uh, you know, be a representative, uh, we'd pay you and uh, give you some free books. So please shoot me an email, shaneliminatorattack.com, and uh, let's chat. 
All right, so as I mentioned earlier on, in September, uh, I posted an interview I conducted with Jim Stum, the editor of Rayo's first book, Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom. Uh, well, I'm the king of outsourcing shit now, so I paid someone to record the audio version of it. Uh, anyway, Jim's been in, in uh, libertarian and in, uh, libertarian anarchist circles for a long, long time. Uh, hell, he uses the same classic, I think, uh, 1960s typewriter and correspondence. Uh, you can see scans of his responses on the website. Uh, just check the show notes for that link. Uh, or search, search for uh, Jim Stum uh, on the website, vanupodcast.com. Uh, I think that's all I have for you. Here's my interview with Jim Stum, the man who met Rayo, uh, narrated by Silas Soul. Uh, please enjoy. Again, and if anyone uh, is going to attend the aforementioned conferences and festivals, uh, please get in contact. Uh, thanks. Uh, until next time. An interview with Jim Stum, the man who met Rayo. Editor's Note. The following is an interview that Shane Radliff conducted with Jim Stum, the editor of Rayo's first book, Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom, and publisher of Living Free, a libertarian newsletter that has been running since 1979. He also met Rayo back in 1971. He'll provide more personal details in the following interview. Of course, an audio-video interview would have been preferable, but Jim is now an older man and hard of hearing. For articles and books he references, links will be provided. Please enjoy and consider giving it a share. Thanks. Shane. Shane starts off by asking, First off, would you mind introducing yourself? Who are you and what do you do? Jim I am a 75-year-old retired janitor and writer. I live alone in an old house in a scruffy neighborhood where I've lived for about 40 years. As a writer, I wrote three books, published by Loom Panics, under the pen name John Fisher. All are now out of print. I have published a newsletter, Living Free, since 1979, 164 issues so far. I have prepared reports often made up of articles from issues of Living Free, and sold photocopies of them. I also sold photocopies of libertarian newsletters, but the Internet has killed that business. Editor's Note Sorry, Jim. Ha! I have written letters of comment that were printed in many zines over the years, but all but one of them are now defunct or gone to the Internet. The one survivor is The Connection, which comes out about every six weeks. I contribute to almost every issue. I have never put anything on the Internet myself. This writing has earned me some money, but not enough to live on. Thus, I janitored to pay the bills and for exercise, and for about the last ten years, for free use of a computer at work with Internet access. Editor's Note I subscribed to The Connection and submitted an introductory piece that should be included in the next issue. It's cheap. All of you should subscribe, or at least get the sample issue for one dollar. Shane asks, Where do you align philosophically and ideologically? Jim 
I am a libertarian. Minarchist. Big tent. In that I accept a libertarian as anyone who has a high regard for personal freedom and a commitment to non-coercion in his own life and in society as far as that might be possible. I consider Venuans to be libertarians, but I am not a Venuan in theory or practice. Shane asks, When did you first come across the libertarian community, and how did it happen? How old were you? Jim I think it was 1968, when I was 24, that I first found that there were other libertarians besides myself. I found books by Ayn Rand in a bookstore at Fort Harrison, near Indianapolis, while I was in the Army, from 1965 to 1968. I read all her novels, and then subscribed to The Objectivist. Then came the split between Rand and Nathaniel Brandon, who had been having an affair, even though both were married to other people. After that, Brandon sent a booklet advertising various libertarian newsletters to, I suppose, the mailing list for the objectivist. I ordered Innovator, and when I saw it, it was a revelation. I had found my own people, my tribe. After that, I ordered all kinds of back issues and other newsletters, including Perform. There was a book written some years ago. It usually begins with Ayn Rand, and that was true for me and many other libertarians of my generation. Shane asks, How much correspondence did you have with Rayo before meeting him? What was your impression of him then? Jim I didn't correspond much with Rayo. I wrote a couple of short notes that he might have published and responded to in Perform. Mostly, I corresponded with R. L. Gifford, who wrote in Vanu Life as Orion. He was painting a rosy picture of life among Vanuans, telling me there were already a number of people in loose association and good prospects for more to be joining them, and he urged me to come out and join them. Before meeting Rayo, from his writing, I had built him up in my mind as sort of a libertarian hero who had found a way to live almost independent of coercive society. I found out that he was a lot less than that. For details, see my Life of Tom Marshall, pages 12 and 13. Shane asks, what did you think of Vanu as a strategy when you first came across it? Jim When I first came across the Vanu strategy, reading about it in Perform, I had no particular opinion of it. I was just gathering information. But when I drove out to Oregon, I was intending to stay. However, that was based on there being a small group of people that I could become associated with in some sense. It turned out I was misinformed, partly by Gifford, who spoke in generalities, but also by Rayo, who said in Vanu Life No. 1, page 1, that there were five people, Tom, Roberta, Rayo, Dr. Gatherer, and Mike Freeman. I also counted Halen and Gifford. So that was seven people. 
I found out it was only three people and some pen names. And Gifford was just a kid who might leave at any time. So if I had stayed out west, I would be mostly alone. I thought I might as well go back to Buffalo, where I could be on familiar ground with some relatives nearby. When I saw Rayo, I thought that camper nomadism might be a good idea for some, but nomadism did not appeal to me. I preferred to be settled in one place. Later, I began to think that owning a few acres of woods would be better than hiding out in the woods on government land and struggling not to be seen by forest rangers or anyone. For more, see The Life of Tom Marshall, page 13. Shane asks, What made you go visit Rayo in 1971? Jim. Richard Nixon led me to Rayo in 1971. In August of 71, Nixon imposed wage and price controls, and I thought that was the beginning of some kind of economic and political collapse. I decided to be underground. And I decided that the best place to do that would be with Rayo and his associates. So I thought I would do what Gifford had been urging me to do. I quit my job in a bank and drove west intending to stay there. I wrote about what happened in The Life of Tom Marshall, pages 12 and 13. Shane asks, Obviously, me and my listeners and readers want to know everything about Rayo. When you met him in person, what was he like? Characteristics, stories, etc. Was he serious all the time, or a jokester? Introverted or extroverted? I just want a more mental image than a Woodstock hippie with a backpack. Jim Rayo was serious, calm, friendly, but not effusive, introverted, and a logical thinker. He was somewhat suspicious of someone like me who he was meeting for the first time. For more, see The Life of Tom Marshall, page 12. Rayo was nothing like a Woodstock hippie. He was older about forty, and his hair was not long. I saw no hint that he had any interest in rock music or protest songs. Rather than a hippie, Rayo was more like the Star Trek character Data. For a second opinion, I'll quote Ben Best, who visited Rayo at his house in L.A. in 1967, and again at his camp in the Oregon woods in 1972. He wrote about his impressions in an article in Liberty Magazine, Volume 1, Number 1, August 1987. Ben said, quote, I first met Tom in L.A. in 1967. He was a tall, slender, Bespeckled electrical engineer, a nerd, inhibited, and at a loss for small talk. He was much more at ease exchanging information or making plans for action. In the spring of 1972, I visited Tom again, attending his Vanu Week program in Oregon. Tom was an acutely fear filled individual who lived in constant expectation of nuclear war, economic collapse, social chaos, and a totalitarian state. He was also intensely conscientious and a trustworthy person. By his own admission, 
he had little interest in, or understanding of, humor. I'm sure there was some relation between Tom's political paranoia and his inhibitions in social situations. He seemed to find the status symbols of that society intolerable and was unable to relate to most people very fruitfully. Tom's intense rationality and integrity are what inspired those who knew him. End quote. Shane asks, How popular or well-known was Rayo, or Tom Marshall, in his heyday? Jim, I don't think Rayo was well-known even among libertarians back in the day, and not known at all among the general public. He was a West Coast guy, so he knew some people out there, but in the rest of the country, we only knew him from his writing in his own and various other newsletters. He knew people in the Free Isles movement in Southern California. He knew Kerry Thornley and that real estate guy in Oregon. See The Life of Tom Marshall, page 12. Four people attended Rayo's Vanu Week campouts in 1972. Ben Best and his girlfriend Lynn were two of them. Ben published that information in Liberty, so I'm not revealing any secrets. I know who the other two were, but I won't name names. Some libertarians probably heard rumors about this guy who lived in the woods, but didn't know any more about him. When Bill Bradford published an article about him in his magazine, Liberty, he called him, quote, the mystery man of the libertarian movement, unquote. Shane asks, if you have any idea, how large was the solutions-orientated libertarian movement throughout the 1960s and 70s? Say, readers of Vanu Life or the new Perform. Jim, my impression is that solutions-orientated libertarians were only ever a small minority among libertarians. Most libertarians were political, or armchair theorists living conventional lifestyles. I don't know what the circulation of Perform or Vanu life was, but it was probably never more than hundreds. Editor's Note Oh, you don't say. Man, things haven't changed much, have they? I'd say that the fact alone, the focus of libertarians for the past 60 years, demonstrates the failed efficacy of the most common strategies, political crusading and theoretical anarchy. Shane asks, Did you pursue any Vanu lifestyles? If so, could you tell us a bit about them? What did you do? Positives, drawbacks, etc. Jim When I returned to Buffalo after visiting Rayo, I became active in food co-ops throughout the 1970s. We did a lot of non-violent illegal stuff. Many co-op members were veterans of civil rights and anti-war protests and had nothing but contempt for the government. It was a pleasure to associate with them. I wrote a 22-page memoir of what I did in those years, which I am running serially in connection. See address in number one above. In 1974, 
I bought six acres of woods in Chautauqua County, New York, for $2,500, and I spent a lot of time camping out there and working on various projects. But now I'm too old and had to give all that up. Shane asks, Compared to the 1960s and 70s, and I suppose the 80s too, what's your view on the pursuance of self-liberation today? Do you think it's worthwhile? Easier or more difficult? And what impact does the current political climate have on your answer? Jim Many of the self-liberation strategies that were used in the 1960s to 1990s would not be possible today due to increased government data gathering and surveillance. How can you hide out in the woods when government can scour the area with drones carrying heat-seeking sensors? And people have been tricked into carrying devices that government can use to track their locations and activities. Mobile phones, credit cards, and ATM cards. And newer vehicles are increasingly fitted out with devices that allow them to be remotely tracked. You can be freer if you are willing to do without many of the devices invented in recent decades. That's easy for an old-timer like me, accustomed to living without them anyway, but few younger people would be willing to give them up. The current political climate is the main problem. I don't mean Trump alone, but all recent presidents and congresses who support the growing surveillance state, especially since 9-11, but also since the end of the civil disobedience of Vietnam War protests, and really since FDR gutted the Constitution in the 1930s and then packed the Supreme Court with his rubber stampers. Shane asks, Now, obviously, I wasn't born until 1992, which means I missed the experience of the Cold War. Rayo is seriously concerned with the risk of nuclear attack at that time. He even thought the likelihood increased by 10% with each passing year. My question for you is this. You lived through that time. Do you think his fears were rational? Irrational? Did you share similar concerns? Jim the scariest time during the Cold War was the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. We were afraid a nuclear exchange could happen at any moment. But that ended without a shot being fired. The fear of nuclear war gradually faded over the years. It gradually dawned on me that nukes were weapons that couldn't actually be used though they were useful as a threat, especially by tyrants who wanted to avoid being overthrown by the U.S. government, having learned the lessons of Iraq and Libya and numerous CIA coups. Fifty years have gone by since Rayo was worrying about nukes, and there has been no nuclear war. So clearly, he was wrong in his fears. Shane asks, One of the comments I received from the hardcore privacy advocates, mainly crypto-anarchists, on Rayo, is that he was truly a pioneer in the field of OPSEC. He talked about encrypted radio nets. He understood the utility of pseudonyms. He explicated the importance of mobility. And he understood that if there is no attribution to an action, punishment can't come, thereby making him more invulnerable to those who would bring forth said punishment. I don't really have a question here for you, but I suppose I'd like to get your thoughts on this if you have any.
Jim. I don't know what modern hardcore privacy advocates have to offer, aside from computer encryption, and I hear that quantum computers may soon nullify that. Mobility won't do you much good if you carry a cell phone that allows your location to be monitored and if you drive a new vehicle with tracking built in. Shane asks, We'll probably never know the answer to this question, but you are the individual most qualified to provide some speculation. What do you think happened to Rayo? Jim as for what happened to Rayo, I don't have much to add to what I wrote on page 26 of The Life of Tom Marshall. The change of address seems significant. In his June 1973 letter, Rayo wrote, quote, All our mail should now go to a P.O. box in Berkeley. End quote and in his September 1973 letter, he said, quote, Berkeley address is still good, unquote. If he was living in Oregon, how did he get his mail from Berkeley to Oregon? Or did he come out of the Oregon woods and move to the San Francisco Bay Area? It seems to me he would want to get his mail near where he was living. I think this is the likely explanation. He was familiar with the Bay Area because that's where he went to buy his year's supply of storable food. So he probably knew about free clinics and other medical services there. Perhaps while he was in Oregon, he developed some serious medical problem and moved to the San Francisco area to get treated. But then, maybe the treatment was not successful, and he died. Perhaps sometime in 1974, after mailing off his last known letter in February. That would have been when he was 42. A young age to die, but I know of three of my relatives who died in their 40s. As far as we know, he never told any of his admirers that he was dying. But then, he wouldn't have. He wouldn't have wanted a mob of people he hardly knew coming around and fawning over him. He would have wanted to be left to die in peace with only Roberta, presumably, by his side. So I don't take what he wrote in his last letter literally. That's just what he might have said to keep people away until after he died and couldn't be disturbed anymore. And the other clue is that no one seems to have heard another word from him after that. Of course not, because he was dead. So that's what I think happened to Rayo but I didn't know him very well. Apart from my one visit in 1971, everything I know about Rayo came from information I received in the mail. There were other people on the West Coast who knew him better than I ever did. There may be some persons out there who can know more about what happened to him than I do. But if you want to hunt them down, you better hurry. Those who are still alive will be pretty old by now. End of interview.